Okay. So today we're going to talk about fiscal year end EMIS and other things like maintenance of effort, grants balancing, and period H balancing back to the USAS application. Now, some of this is going to be just information so that if you hear it, like the word maintenance of effort, you don't like, uh, you know, freak out or anything. You, you've you heard the term, you might uh, know what to do. You have a resources here that you could um, help the user to get their information that they need. So the purpose is just to explain some of these financial terms here at the beginning, just to help to get to know them. So first of all, maintenance of effort, what is it? Sometimes you hear it as MOE, um, and it refers to the requirement that the districts have that they have to keep their federal grant monies, uh, or I'm sorry, they, for their federally funded grant programs, the school district has to demonstrate the same level of local funds for that particular program to remain constant from year to year. And why that is important is they don't want the school districts to take the federal grant money and use it instead of the local money. They want the grant monies to supplement the programs and not supplant. So there's another term that you might hear, but none of that is something that you need to know about calculations or anything. It's just terms that to get used to. There is two uh, like programs with maintenance of, of effort, ESEA and the IDEA, which is the like the special ed. I've put a link here for the Ohio DEW that will, this is where the slide came from actually. It explains how the ESEA came into existence or the law and the programs that are underneath it. And if you go to here, I mean, it's exactly what that link will show you. I just listed them out. So there's the programs on the ODEW website. And then this link will show you the um, where you can get resources to help the user. The current EMIS manual, that's a link. This section, which if we go to that, keeps popping up on the other screen. And you search MOE, you can see the Title I, let me, Title I, which is the ESCA, MOE included expenditures, and the special ed expenditures. So if you go to the page five, Sorry for the scroll. There's your accounts and programs, which I have on a slide as well. And then for treasurers, and they should know this too, but there's a section managing your grant that opens up to this. And these are all links in case you wanted to learn more, go to it. But there's additional resources there that they would be able to go to, including their um, grant information. And a good FAQ section on for the treasurers that they're probably aware of as well. So in that EMIS manual, it does say that the the ESEA maintenance of effort. They The districts must demonstrate their expenditures from local and state funds to be relatively constant from year to year for the reason I said earlier. They have to, the ODEW or um, ODE or whoever, they'll calculate this to be 90, that the districts have to spend at least 90% of their prior year's expenditures for the current year, either in total aggregate or by pupil. And that 
section that I pulled up just a few moments ago, it'll say these two funds are included in the ESEA maintenance of effort. So when a district doesn't maintain their effort in spending, the district may be penalized and lose some of that federal grant monies the following year because they have to maintain their level of spending or they'll take away the monies. There are a few waivers, um, just, just so that you know that there are possible waivers that the district may be able to use. But again, it's the district's responsibility to determine if they meet maintenance of effort or if any of the exceptions are offered or any of the offered exceptions are applicable. The one that you hear probably more about is the IDEA maintenance of effort. Um, and that is because unless an exception applies, IDEA maintenance of effort must be the same or more the following year. Um, and it's just because, again, to supplement the program that that you're spending out of your local and state funds. And this is how they look at it, either the local funds only. Um, they do this calculation, that calculation, as well as the student per capita. capita. And then they take the, the most beneficial to the district for their calculation. So remember, I in this manual, I showed you that section on page five. That's what the slide is, came right from it. And this is the one that does the calculation, the Office of Exceptional Children. So this slide is from, sorry, from that manual. And it shows what or how the IDEA maintenance of effort is calculated. They use these funds, these functions, which are um, functions for the special ed IDEA grant, but under these funds, and then the objects that would be used for the calculation. There are exceptions, but no waivers for IDEA. And like I said before, it must be the same, that the IDEA maintenance of effort must be maintained at 100% or more to be met. So now that you know everything that you probably need to know, how is this gathered? And it's gathered because, or gathered through the period H EMAS financial data reporting submission. And Amanda's gonna highlight that um, later in this presentation. The, when you're looking at the IDE maintenance of effort, the student per capita was one of those optional calculations that they will do. So those numbers come from the period H, or sorry, period S, student data reporting submission. So again, this PowerPoint and training is just to kind of like tie everything together and why we do the things that we do and what, what comes of the period H EMAS financial reporting and how it's used. So, <coughs> excuse me. District, districts can review these expenditures prior to the fiscal year end by a couple different ways. I believe they still can do an early EMIS collection before close in June to like validate their accounts as well as to check their MOE expenditures. We do have a USAS template report under the report manager that I will show you in a moment. And that report actually uses an account filter that can that is already like built into that report. So let's go to the USAS application. 
And this report is actually, well, let's look at the account filter first. Because the report has this account filter already built into it. So you see how it has all those funds that were on that slide, one through 3,000. All the functions are built into that and it matches the EMIS, I think it was 6.1 section, as well as the slide and then the objects. So by using this and go into the SSDT budget summary MOE. Oops. Um, the filters are already built into it. So I'm going to run this. And again, this is going to give you the local and state funds that were in that slide where um, it was like funds 001 through 300 and then the certain functions. So this, they can use this report to compare their expenditures that they had for this program from last year. You can also um, use that filter on other reports. So if they want to run the financial detail, that filter, is available to use. I might not have um, expenditures in this demo database for that, but it is available and I know it works because I had, thought I had a, one already pulled up, but, oh, no, that's a different one, I'm sorry. So any questions so far? So, how does a district know if they met their MOE or failed their MOE? They're gonna, you won't know, there's no way that ITCs can check. They're gonna uh, log on to their CCIP menu and go under the MOE home menu to find out. If the district does fail, they will be notified. And that's probably when you're gonna hear from them, like to ask you what reports to run. And again, that budget summary or that account filter would be helpful for the IDE MOE. Um, and then if the district meets MOE, they don't notify the district or email the district. So any questions on maintenance of effort? Hey, Pat, this is Andrew from WOCO. Yes. So you mentioned up, uploading a period age file uh, before June, just to kind of validate accounts. I guess what what is the purpose of that versus the like the account validation report? You know, like what, what does that do? I mean, I know it spits out a bunch of errors at you. Um, I believe um, they can pull the expenditure data and you can compare the expenditure data from what's in like USAS. It's, I mean, I it would be an, another, an easier way would probably be run the reports in um, USAS, like the budget summary. But if they wanted to pull to see what was actually going to be reported on the I EMIS see. side. Yes, that makes then sense. They, yeah. I think they can still do an early pull 
I think they pull every so often for the data to be current. Hey, Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's more about checking what figures are going to be reported than it is about the accounts themselves. Like Correct. The coding. Yeah, that makes sense. But like you said, the filter is there. So there's no, I mean, it does the same thing and it's more, it's a it's lot easier. To read. USS is, USS is nicer than the data collector and it's prettier. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Pat, can I chime? This is Vicki from the Omen. Can I chime in? Sure. So um, the MOE report works perfect. Um, it pulls in everything that it needs to to match up. And it's very easy to go into the CCIP and see what that number is that you need to meet. And then when you run that MOE, you just need to go to the bottom and make sure that it matches. At one point in time, and I do not know if this is still true, if you submit it before June 30th, then you could, it's like a soft submit and ODE will let you know if you've passed or if you failed before the critical deadline, which would allow you in June then to make any corrections prior to closing, prior to failing. Um, because if you fail the MOE, it's quite time consuming to be able to get those things corrected and and the exceptions are extremely minimal. Um, so it just allows a district to see if they're gonna pass and then make any appropriate adjustments prior to closing. Yeah. If that helps you out, Andrew. That makes a lot of sense. And so I have a question too, kind of following up with that. Like, let's say they don't do that and then they fail and it's the middle of July and they've closed June. And they have some expense, they go back and they realize, hey, you know what, I probably could reclassify this expense, you know, are they allowed to reopen June and do a disbursement error correction to move it? Or how would, how, what would be the appropriate process for reclassifying? Like, we're, we're not, no new expenditures or revenue, we're just talking about reclassifying it so that it hits an MOE applicable account. Is that what you would do? Yeah, and then the period H uh, re financial reporting closes like August 30th. So you have that okay. time period to fix it. And then after that, um, it's a lot more. Oh, I'm sure there's an appeal and it's terrible. I'm sure it's terrible after that. Um, okay, I just didn't, I'm not, that, that makes sense. So you are allowed to reopen 12, reclassify the expenses, and then close it so that you get all the reports again, because you just made a big change, and then move forward, it, if it's before the deadline still. And I would think most treasurers are gonna budget consistently from year to year. They know this better than we do. But thank you, Vicki, for adding more information like from that side. Oh, you're welcome. All right, any other questions? So uh, many districts get grant money federally and many grants are maintained in what's called the CCIP website, which just stands for Continuous Comprehensive Improvement Plan. And districts will log into the SAFE account to access this. So in there, I'm not sure if it's the treasurer or the superintendent or who, but the budget planning is uh, done in the CCIP. And then the treasurer will do the financial reporting of the expenditures, which can be pulled from USAS. And then the cash requests are also processed. So project cash requests or PCRs are done to request monies to be like request monies for the district's expenditures spent or to be spent against the approved grant budget. And they may be required to submit like a detailed financial report to back up the PCR 
numbers that you're requesting the money to be reimbursed for. And I'll show you a, an example in a moment. But what's on there is the report as of period, just like our reports in USAS, and then the year to date by the object codes. So when districts spend more than what their cash balance is, that's when the CTIP triggers the PCR payment to the district. So on the PCR, oh, and I put a, a link how to complete one. Districts or treasurers should probably know that, but I put the link there. This is what is the breakdown on the project cash request, which I have an example here. This is right from the CCIP. So again, they're gonna break it down to salaries, benefits, purchase services, and so forth. So in order to get that information, there is under the public shared reports, there is this report called PCR financial detail. And you notice it breaks it down by 100s, uh, by the object codes that you need in order to plug them into here. So where you find that is, again, you can easily find it under here. And then it's, it's downloadable. Um, downloadable and then you can pull it into your report manager. So here's a bigger version of it of 100, object code 200 and so forth. So this is helpful too, to know and to utilize for your districts. And that is actually the link for the report. If So you really don't have to go to the public shared reports if you want to utilize it there. Um, sometimes districts may have until September 30th to pay the obligations that are encumbered on purchase orders. Um, so for example, purchase services for psychological services may not be billed until July or August, but your purchase order is encumbered by the end of June. So you have until that sometimes to pay your June, you know, the fiscal year obligation, if that makes sense. And then sometimes when districts do that, then you might hear something called the September 30th report. And that's if the district is required to, you know, submit more information, ODE wants more information from that period that is beyond the fiscal year. And then the final expenditure report is the final report for that grant. And it's usually due around September 30th. And that basically is um, balancing all your project cash requests that you received along with your expenditures. So if we went into the system, One way to do it is to run like a cash summary report. So my grant for 572 with my special cost center, if I generated this report, you can see that the amount received matches the amount expended, to, expended. That's what you want on your final expenditure report. All your project cash requests add up to this, all your expenditures add up to this, which equals what the district is entering in the CCIP. But they might also use the financial report. 
I think it was like I don't know why that's not working for me today. There we go. There must have had a space in there. So you can also, they can also use the financial detail report to show all the received amounts by receipt number and then the expenditures by purchase order number. So there's a lot of resources and reports that you can utilize to help balance the grants. Any questions before I hand it over? Yeah. Can I ask another question? I'm trying to, Absolutely. I've never been a treasurer. So here I am trying to learn what they, they do. Um, do either of those reports cross fiscal years? Because my thought is, right, like like the FINDEC, can that cross fiscal years? Because if you're, if we're saying they're allowed to go through September 30, wouldn't we want to be able to see it? I'm so not familiar with you, Seth. I just never. Yes. I, I was going to say, I, you could in classic. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, well, that, yeah, I love this report. I love thin debt. So yeah, that's what I would be using. Yes, because you have to um you have to support, you have to be able to report the expenditures from the beginning of the grant year to the end of the grant year. So yeah. when you're talking July and August, you're running that report from July of the previous fiscal year through like, so it would be July 1 of 23 through August 30th of 24 to be able to capture all of the expenditures for that particular grant. Because over the summer, you're going to have salaries and benefits coming out of like your Title I account. Yeah. And you have to be able to account for that. So is FINDET what people typically use then for this because it can go across? Yes. Or that PCR financial detail report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's in the public shared, right? Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, this is so this is so helpful. I don't know. Have we done this before in the past? If not, I must have. Uh, I don't know. This is I great. I don't think we did, but that's kind of what you know, like the purpose to kind of like tie it all together and see why we do why what we do. So this is this has been great. The feedback from everybody and the questions. All right, so if Amanda's ready, I'll let her share. I thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Pat. Awesome, Pat, thank you. Uh, let me get mine shared here. Okay. I need my window. All right. Okay. Okay, I can close a couple of these things because we're going to end up in there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Pat. As Pat said, I think that, you know, doing something like this, it's it's a little bit different than what we've done before. And, you know, what we're trying to do is give some context to some of these things. Um, and, and what I'm about to talk about now is kind of the financial data reporting piece or the period age. Um, we're going to see some screenshots of the data collector. And by no means am I like a professional to train on the data collector itself. That thing is a beast. I'm sure there are EMIS professionals at your ITCs <laughs> that um, are much wiser on that than we are here. But uh, I thought it would be helpful. And a lot of things like some of the parts that I do want to talk about include what you find in that data collector. So I'm like, let's dabble in it a little bit 
so that we can get an idea. And then, um, of course, I have resources throughout here, um, as with Pat's portion, you know, so we try to put the resources that we know of out here to help you, um, you know, go the next step as well. Um, all right. So, uh, so for the financial data reporting, basically the process of submitting the financial data to the state. So, um, we we mentioned this in our fiscal year end uh, meeting. You know, we talk about the period H reporting, um, but basically what this process is. So an authorized person in the district, either an EMS coordinator, maybe the treasurer sometimes, um, they're going to upload the flat file and run the data collection process to submit the data. So um, that, again, happens in the what's called the data collector. Um, this must be submitted before their period H closes for the year. We'll talk about that timeline um, a little bit uh, into this presentation. And then the main step that I'm going to kind of uh, like why I really wanted to talk about this is this point that after the data is prepared and validated before it's certified, it's strongly recommended that you preview the data before you approve it for submission. Um, luckily, we don't get a lot of uh, like tickets or feedback with, you know, um, too many issues, but like some of the ones that I've seen, I feel like um, may have been prevented if this uh, preview step is really done. And I think it would be pretty easy to do. But, you know, it's one of those hard things where I think this process because it's you know, maybe the EMIS coordinator is submitting this and then it's just going through or, you know, maybe the treasurer submits this and they're not, it's like the only thing that they submit in there. So they're not really wise to like what they should be doing in each step. So that's when we get there. That's the step that I really want to um, focus on here. Uh, okay. So, oh, wait, wait, you know what? Going too fast. So let me not skip my resources here. Um, down at the bottom, I also have the EMIS manual linked. I'm going to go ahead and click on this because I want to show you the section that we're referring to. Um, if I go down here, section six is financial records. And so when we're looking at this, look, first of all, we have, and I think this opens a new tab, we have the USAS manual linked right here. Um, because, you know, we've talked about the account codes, how it's all set up into the funds function objects, you know, those all mean specific things based on AOS, uh, but, the, but, um, the EMIS manual does, um, tie into those as well. And, uh, basically when they're support, or I'm sorry, when they're reporting their, uh, figures, they're going to report their accounts. And those account codes are going to directly help the state determine what they're spending money for. Um, as Pat highlighted perfectly in the first part in talking specifically about the MOE accounts, you know, so they specifically look at those certain account codes to see are they spending that money in those designated accounts for that designated purpose. So essentially when we're looking at it here, you know, this is collecting all the financial records and then using that whole collection of data for multiple different um, things. But uh, what we see in this specific grid that is helpful is um, there's details here on um, each one of the different things that, that they're actually collecting um, that is actually being submitted with this financial um, poll and or submission. <laughs> and so I just clicked on this first one here, the chapter six element list. And this gives us a nice little overview of all the things that are being collected. So if we look at something like the cash record, you can see that for each cash account is going to be reporting the encumbered amount, the fund balance. Um, and then obviously like the fund but look at fiscal year expenditures, fiscal year receipts. And then here's expenditure record, here's the receipt record. So for each type of account, for all of their accounts, it is also going to be reporting like those actual fiscal year end totals. So that's why sometimes when we talk about like, um, you know, if they're after the fiscal year, and they have to make a change in the prior fiscal year, something like this, whether or not they've already submitted their period H and if they need to resubmit is something definitely to consider if there is a situation where they later go back and change figures. 
Uh, the other page that I have linked here is Emus Resources. And, um, you know, this one I just linked, I don't have anything like super specific as far as these different links to point out, but this is kind of a collection of some different resources. It's got the Emus manual on here, but other things like release notes and changes, um, there's validation and report explanations. So when I was looking at this, I was like, okay, there, it seems like there's a lot of good resources on here, um, depending on you know, what they may need to look into uh, if they're looking at some of these reports. And we'll talk about validations as well. Okay. All right. So that's what I wanted to look at there. There's a little screenshot. So when it comes to what they get from USAS, uh, there's going to be two, port two parts to this. And we, you know, we talk about this at the fiscal year end. Um, meeting and checklist, but we talk about a lot of stuff then. <laughs> so some of these slides have information directly from that FYE um, presentation as well, but kind of adjusted a little bit um, for specifically what we're talking about here. But, but um, you know, it, it's, it's directly related to what they're prepping for and doing um, with some of those fiscal year end steps. So the first portion of information that goes into uh, this submission comes from the EMIS extract. So those pieces are the cash reconciliation, civil proceedings, and uh, district building and profile information, um, building profile information rather. And then there's a second part of this, which is the SIF agent. And that is what's going to actually pull the cash, the expenditure, the revenue accounts. So like when we were seeing it's pulling the actual account code, it's pulling the expenditures or revenues, um, all of that account data, and then also what their OPUs are. Um, that is going to be pulled from the SIF agent. Okay. All right. So um, now we're, I'm just going to talk about each side of this a little bit more. So the EMIS extract, again, here's the information that pulls, but where that's coming from. So like when we go through the fiscal year on training and we go into the periodic menu and the building profiles and, you know, those all have to equal 100 uh, percent. Those have specific IRNs related to them. Um, that specifically is being set up to be reported with this period H poll. The cash reconciliation, that's specifically being set up. Um, I mean, they can use that every month if they want, but it is going to specifically pull and report um, for this period H reporting. So when they do these things, and I linked to the checklist here, those are all on the checklist. Um, those are all being set up to be included. And then for this portion, they actually will be like manually creating the file to bring out of USAS and to put into the data collector. So that happens on the extracts EMIS menu. Um, they choose the year when they pull this. So whatever year they choose is what it's going to pull information for. Generate the extract file. And then in the data collector, I don't, I wasn't able to get a specific, I have a couple screenshots from the data collector, but I kind of uh, piecemealed them together. I don't specifically have access to the data collector, so I did my best, <laughs> but, um, but I believe it's in the top right of the data collector page. There's like a tab that says data sources. And if they click on that tab, then there's a way they can add a data source and basically upload a file. And so within there, they would take this uh, this SEQ file that they've extracted from USAS with these pieces of information, and then they would upload that into um, in as a data source. Okay, so that's like the manual part. That's that's where they need to like actually. They're actually pulling a specific file and uploading and saying, here, use this information. The other part of this with um, with the, the SIF poll is basically what's happening is the system is going to be connected in the background. So the data collector is actually connected to USAS. And when they go to do the collection, oh, thank you so much. For, okay, so Rhonda in the chat says, 
data sources, then other data sources, delete the old EMIS file, then upload the new SEQ file. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, awesome. It's been a while since I've been in there. <laughs> Um, okay, so yes, so um, once that's uploaded, then the part for actually pulling, and, and this is the part that's going to pull like the account, the figures, um, and that sort of thing. And especially if we think about, um, and we'll kind of talk about the time frame here, I think I have that a little bit later, but uh, if we think about maybe like re having to re-pull, you know, we're okay, we're going to pull the data, and then maybe we're going to re-pull it at some point. The, the things that probably aren't going to change are in the EMIS extract file. So they, I don't see where they would normally be having to, you know, go in and re-upload that. Usually they do that once and that, that information isn't going to change unless there's like a very specific situation. If they're pulling, especially if they do something like maybe a preliminary pull in June, like was being discussed for MOE, um, they might then go ahead and like want to re-pull their data again later. And so having this, having SIF connected, having the SIF agent go in and grab the data, that's going to allow it to grab it directly from USAS. So it's all kind of happening in this bridge in the background. So the first thing to talk about with this is the EMIS SOAP configuration. So in the system configuration page, there's EMIS SOAP configuration. And this is in USAS. And what this has is it has a fiscal year set. So again, this is on, um, this is, we talk about this at fiscal year end to check this, but whatever fiscal year is set up in this configuration, when SIF goes and does that bridge, it's going to look at this and it's going to say, oh, you want me to get 2024 data? Okay, perfect. Let me get the fiscal year data. When I see fiscal year expenditures, receipts, I'm going to get that as of 2024. Now, what this configuration helps with is I set this to 2024, and then whether I'm in June, if I go ahead and close June and I move to July in my software, like now technically the district's in 2025, if they do that SIF pull again, as long as this configuration still says 2024, it still knows to pull 24. So they don't have to worry about like making sure they do that pull at a specific point in time because generally the window is open until like August. So as long as this is set correctly, then they could make that pull at any point. Um, so that that's one thing to check. Uh, we have a couple other slides here. And again, these are usually in the, in the fiscal year end um, presentation and I usually breeze over them. So I was like, well, let me add these here um, as well, just so we can kind of talk about them. But uh, what these are, so most, I, I would think that this is probably already set up, but if you have new districts or, um, you know, if there's a situation that you need to troubleshoot something like this information can be helpful. But what this shows is configuring the SOAP service with USASR. So this is something that would be like, you guys would do this at the ITC. Um so uh, we have, oh, you know what? I think this link is probably outdated. Um, I need to update that and I, I will update that in the presentation uh, later. But uh, so let's see. So here's the configuration that we talked about. But what happens in the USAS side is in the users, what you would do is you would create a user, like create an EMIS SIF user and um, you can assign it uh, basically this EMIS SIF access. And so basically you can have that username and password that can then be used to connect. Now we have SOAP endpoints here. So here's an example of like what the SOAP endpoint would look like. It's, it would be a URL. And then you take that information and um, in the SIF agent zone configuration, um, I believe this would be something that like your tech team would, uh, when I was at the ITC, like our tech team kind of managed this part. Um, and so with this, there's a setting here for the SOAP connections within, so this is within the SIF agent. Um, and you would be able to put in the username and then the password from that USAS account, as well as that URL. 
And so then now you're going to have, okay, so now they're connected through this user. And when we see later in the data collector, when we talk about pulling that data, it's going to go use that bridge through this user account. That's how it gets access to USAS. And then it's going to grab the data. All right. All right, here we go. So so this is where we're going to talk about, um, th this is the timelines, which we've kind of referred to these, we talked about it with um, the MOE submission time, but uh, these are, oh, I forgot to go to E off this slide. <laughs> A lot of W on there. Um, so these are draft schedules because they could change these. Uh, I grabbed these ones before our fiscal year end meeting. So um, I didn't actually uh, double check before, um, like since then, but uh, there is a link here. So whatever the current schedule is, if there are changes, they'll update it there. So I recommend referring to it on their website um, since it can change. But you see here financial collections, financial collection 2024, and then see it says 2024H, and it's H right here. So that's our period H. It opens June 3rd and then um, it goes through August 30th, at least as of um, when I had taken this screenshot. So that's where, um, you know, if they wanted to do some preliminary. Uh, collections in June. So starting June 3rd, uh, that collection should be available and then they could pull and review their data um, to get things started. Okay. So this is the part where I got a couple of visuals uh, related to the data collector. And um, I just want to talk about a little bit of like what they're doing in there. So when they actually go in, when they actually go in, um, what the what they can do, so once it opens, they can locate the period age collection, and then it's gonna look a little something like this. I blocked out some of the irrelevant data. Um, but they basically have an action to start a collection. And when they do that, they'll see something that looks kind of like this. And you have, if you see the header here says SIF zone. And then the bottom there's data sources. And so this is, you know, I wanted to show this because, you know, when we're talking just on the USAS side, we're like, okay, they get the EMS extract and then the rest comes over in the SIF zone. And so when they start this, this is where it's saying, okay, so they would um, select this and that's gonna say, okay, that connection through the EMIS user that set up the bridge, I wanna use that. And then data sources is where they've put the EMIS extract file and they say, okay, I wanna use that too because they're gonna get the pieces of information from both for um, what they're reporting. And then they would start the collection. And here's just another slide I had um, that kind of shows again what we were talking about where uh, it's grabbing them from both. So, um, yeah, I don't know uh, if I'm going to read through it specifically, but uh, this one, this is one that I grabbed from our fiscal year end meeting, but it's going to kind of summarize in a different way. Uh, and you know what? The other thing that I want to show, I should have left that open. Let's go back to our EMIS manual. I like our little element list. So, um, so, you know, I was talking here, okay, we have the cash records, we have the expenditure. What I didn't specifically uh, point out here is, let's see, oh wait, I thought, did you name? Yeah, here's our district iron. Oh, okay, well, I guess it doesn't have the building, or at least I'm not seeing it stand out at me, the building information on there, but that does get, that does get included. <laughs> I just thought maybe that would give us a good visual of like, okay, here's all the data and then we can kind of link it to this is coming from this side, this is coming from that side, but oh well. Um, all right, so then the next step after that, so after they go ahead and start the collection, then they're gonna get like a little list of actions here. And the next thing that they can do is prepare the data. 
And um, so when they prepared the data, and this is the part that I'm like not 100% clear on, you know, I think it could be, I'm not sure if it's situational or whatnot, but again, not a data collector expert, but I'm pretty sure that when they start the collection, it may show them that like, if they have some errors, when they prepare the data, they can they can still look at the validation errors after that step. I do know that. Like, even if it tells them before you have these errors, like when they prepare, um, then they can they can look at errors. So level one validation errors, I found this, um, you know, certainly go by like their official documentation, but this made sense to me. I found this in relation to, um, with the data collector. So it's like a general um, information about these different, uh, error types that they can have. So fatal, the record's not going to be submitted if you submit the collection as it is right now. Um, and then you'd fix, you need to fix the data errors which cause the fatal validations before the collection records will be submitted. Critical is the data should be, should be corrected, but the record would still be included in the submission. A warning is that an error probably occurred, should be investigated. And informational is basically just informational. It you know may or may not be an error. Like you could proceed to submit. Um, and then these are like other warning messages that we specifically um, see. This is where you know when we talk about it from the USAS side, we have that account validation report that you can run in USAS ahead of time. Um, and so this is where, you know, specifically looking at some of the accounts, like the fund, fu uh, the function object or receipt must be defined at a higher level of detail, um, subject or instructional level must be entered for like a specific function or object code, or the OPU must be entered, um, for the EMIS guide. So, uh, we also have the note here, if the district receives level one or level two fatal errors, and they've closed the the year. June can be reopened to make any necessary changes. So, um, in this case, with these errors, that would be uh, an account change. If the if it's something where the account code is actually incorrect uh, and is not valid, they would account change to a new account. Uh, the other thing that I learned when I was looking into this, uh, again, not an expert, but. Um, I want to mention this because I, I thought I, I'm and I'm putting this together a little bit with uh, what Pat was talking about is um, when I was kind of overviewing, I was looking at because they have the level one and level two validations. And I'm so sorry if this is like common knowledge and I just learned it. <laughs> but uh, but what I thought was interesting is the level one validations, like obviously, like I, I know that those happen, you know, earlier in the process. Um, so when they prepare the data, it's going to look and validate it, you know, at face value, like, are the accounts valid? Is this a valid combination? Like, is there anything that stands out? Level two errors involve, um, actually, uh, I believe those don't come until after the data has been submitted in some context, um, because that has to do with either comparing to, like, previous years. So um, I would assume that like the MOE uh, related, um, I'm not sure if that's specifically an error though, but uh, but the level two is more like comparing either to previous data or to like other district data kind of thing. So basically that has to be reviewed by um, ODEW to uh, get that and that's why those are level two validations because it's basically like what it's validating so uh I thought that was interesting <laughs> I hope I didn't make that spit that out too confusing <laughs> all right all right so here's the stuff that I really want to talk about and this is the preview data so after the data is prepared and validated before it is um, certified and submitted to the report authority, it's strongly recommended that you preview the data before you approve it for submission. So if you see here in these actions, you know, once the collection has been started, um, the preview option is here. And so if they click preview, they can click generate preview. Um, it has like file format here and what they would get looks something like this. Um, I had to, uh, 
uh that i think it might be a different color it might may actually be blue in the background the collections aren't actually open right now so <laughs> had to do um so you know this screenshot might not be exact but i wanted to get something close because what we can see here in this preview step is um that there are csv files of all the information that's being submitted Okay, so Carol says um, that that was a good explanation. Level two errors, thank you. Um, your understanding has been that level two errors for financial reporting is rare. You don't recall ever seeing one for a district, at least not recently. Well, that's really good to know, and and that makes sense too because like the level ones are like what you would get a lot of the information from the financials just based on what the actual data is. Is the account the right kind of account? is this formatted in the right kind of way like i can definitely see that that is more apt to be something that can be um recognized with a level one validation awesome thank you all right so so we see here and a lot of times and i you know i don't really know but i feel like um you know i can see it happening here where when you look at these um you come in and you're like, okay, valid, invalid, total records. And when you look at this, like you're looking, okay, wh what, where do I have invalids, right? What, what errors do I have? I'm focusing on this column. If everything's valid, I'm good to go. But what I would recommend is, um, is basically like using this step and this is where this information can be tied back to USAS because this is the opportunity now to say, okay, it went and it took the SIF, you know, the SIF made that little bridge. It went over to USAS and it grabbed all of that account data. Remember, we're collecting our expenditures, our receipts. You know, we're actually um, getting figures. Uh, here we go. Actual receipts. Like we're actually getting figures from that fiscal year. So I could have all, all correct account codes, you know, and I'm not getting any errors because the account codes look great. But I want to actually verify that the correct like totals are being submitted. And um, doing this step is um, because like if you do this step to validate, then that's really going to help catch like if there is a situation where somebody forgot to change the year in the configuration, all of the records could be totally valid as far as accounts codes go. But if the actual like uh, fiscal to date expenditures are last year's expenditures, then that would still be a problem that that the data collector doesn't know to flag. So um, Rhonda asks, the federal assistance summary and detail won't be pulled in the data collection this year though, right? Correct. It, it is no longer being reported um, through EMIS. So the federal assistance summary and detail used to be in that EMIS extract file. Um, it used to get pulled in that, but it's no longer being included. Um, so, yep, that's just just left out now. Um, okay, so so I have a little summary here. We're like, okay, when we're looking at this, so we you can see we have the cash record. and and if they if you pull these, like when they are at this preview step, you can click right on the CSV, it'll download it, and they can open it. And then it's actually going to have a CSV with all of these different columns with all of the totals. So what I would suggest is something like, okay, you have your cash record and this has the expenditures and receipts. Um, you could pull this and then in USAS, pull a cash summary report and get the total on that. And then in the CSV, do a total and compare your fiscal to date expenditures and received amounts. Um, and obviously you want that cash summary to be from June and make sure that that totals. Um, you have your expenditure record, that's a budget summary, your receipt record, that's a revenue summary. And then you have some of these other ones, like you can see the civil proceedings. So, you know, you can check, they, they can compare that to like the civil proceedings they've entered for the current year. Um, I actually, I see now, yeah, this, uh, this screenshot because the, because the, uh, it's not actually open right now. So this screenshot is, from last year, um, it's it's looking back at last year's period H data. So yeah, so if you see that on these, um, that will not look the same this year, but you're gonna have, it would still be like a list similar to this with the things that are 
valid for 24. Um, so then, yeah, it, and basically I just have a couple bullet points summarizing what I'm saying here is in, this ensures that um, not just that the records are like valid, like, oh, okay, these account codes make sense, but that the correct information is actually being reported. And then the next thing that I have on here is, so um, we we talk about this in USAS with this total as of period, but um, this can be a place where it's really handy because if they are, uh, say, you know, they're submitting and it's the beginning of August and they're like, okay, I, you know, I got my cash record CSV. Now I want to go um, look at a cash summary, but they're already in like July or August they can go ahead and use the total as of period, uh, total as of period um, parameter here, enter any date in June, and then that will give them the report as of June of 2024 so that they can compare then that report easily without having to change their posting periods. Um, for the budget summary, that one you can run as a canned report, and that one would be this drop down where they could pick June of 2024. Again, in the scenario that we're like talking about here, they would be after June, and they could pick June and then run their budget summary as of June to be able to compare that back to the expenditure record information. All right. And then um, once the errors have been addressed and the data reviewed, they can use certify and submit to submit the collection. Uh, my understanding, uh, at least from what I remember from my ITC days, is uh, I'm pretty sure that you can uh, submit multiple times as long as you're within that window. Um, I feel pretty confident about that, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and so that's where, you know, that's actually going to uh, submit the collection and send the data. And so... Um, I believe when we're talking about, uh, you know, doing like preliminary submissions in June for like that MOE data, they go ahead and, and, and do that stuff. So, um, so that's like the general process. Again, you know, as far as like some of these steps, I'm just kind of just talking about like the general steps because I wanted to talk about that part in the middle um, where they can verify the other thing that I want to mention, too, is that, um, you know, I know I mentioned my screenshot is from like a previous year because the collection's not actually open and I needed a screenshot. <laughs> uh, but if they want to go back and look at previous years that they've submitted, if they want to go back and look at the different reports and stuff that they have, um, I mean, again, this is the screenshot actually came from like a prior year. Uh, they can do this collection request and then um, looking at the data set is H and select show closed collections. And um, you can see here that it gave them like a little grid and you could open up the financial collection and then they can see different reports as well associated with their previous years, um, as well as like get this grid showing what they've previously submitted. I don't know for sure if they need to go do that right now, but if you want to get an example um, or if you yourself have access to the data collector and you just want to look at what these look like to anticipate um, for the future, that is the path to looking these up. Okay. Okay. Do we have any questions? I just wanted to make a note that the the link for the SOAP service configuration has been updated on the Awesome. PowerPoint. Thank you, Pat. And honestly, I can't thank everybody enough for their participation and their comments to go along with our. Yeah, this is great. And I think we were like a little bit nervous about doing something like this because it's a little bit different than what we do. Like, we're like, I know that, you know, this, that it's, it's parts that touch USAS, so we're familiar with them. And we want to like put it in that context, but we're also like, I'm like, okay, you know, not a data collector professional, but I want to talk about it because, you know, we thought something like this would help. So awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, I, I agree, Pat. Thank you so much to everyone who asked questions, who participated. We really appreciate that. 
Um, so we have some upcoming sessions. June 7th, we're going to be doing the um, May recap for releases. And then um, June 14th, there's a deeper dive into STRS Advance. So sort of um, the end of our kind of fiscal year end uh, little series that we did this year, really, <laughs> between the uh, fiscal year end meetings and then um, kind of our uh, UCS session here, STRS Advance. And then um, June 21st, we're back with UCS with a deeper dive into AP invoicing, um, employee self-service training on June 28th. And then um, at the start of July, we'll do the June recap of releases. Okay. If you guys have any ideas for topics too, please share. Yeah. Um, we changed the surveys. So when you actually close out of the Zoom meeting, it's going to open in the browser. Uh, we'd love your feedback. So if you liked a session like this, please let us know in the survey. Or um, as Pat said, that would be a great place to give us any ideas for um, future things you'd like to see in training. So, uh, well, thanks so much, everybody. Have a great long weekend. Awesome. All right. Thank you.